Okay, we can start. Uh, welcome back, everybody. So this is uh, the final lecture of uh, Matthias's set of three lectures, uh, who's going to tell us about tensionless CGCFT. So over to you, Matthias. Okay, thank you very much. So um, let me remind me, remind you where we are in this sort of uh, development of the subject as I explained to you. So. I, I started out by motivating where we expect to find the world sheet theory that's exactly due to the symmetric orbifold. And then I basically calculated the spectrum of this world sheet theory in two slightly different ways. Once using the Novi Schwartz Ramon formalism of Maldesino Ogori. And then the last time I also explained how you how this uh, works in the hybrid formalism and the hybrid, and they're somewhat complementary. I mean, the hybrid formalism is gives you a clear explanation of uh, why only a certain family of representations appear because of the representation theory of PSU 1, 1 slash 2. On the other hand, the physical state condition is somewhat easier to analyze in the nervous schwartz ramond formalism, and we've sort of been jumping a little bit between the two. But the upshot from last time was that uh, this world sheet theory, the uh, Westermino-Witten model world sheet theory, or its hybrid incarnation at level one, is exactly dual, reproduces exactly the spectrum of the symmetric orbifold of T4. And what I mean by that, it reproduces the single particle spectrum, which in the context of the symmetric orbifold means all the states that come from the single cycle twisted sector and are single particle excitations there. <clears throat> so that <clears throat> more or less establishes that the spectrum is the same. So in order to show that the theories are the same, we should also try to understand whether the correlation functions uh, are reproduced. And so this is what I basically want to concentrate on today. I want to explain to you how the correlation functions that you can calculate in the symmetric orbifold, and I'll, I'll review how you calculate them and what their structure is, how you can see them from the point of view of this ADS3 dual world sheet description. Um, and then if I have time, I'll also try to uh, indicate a little bit of how our analysis, which so far has been purely about ADS3 cross S3 cross T4, generalizes to ADS5 cross S5. And uh, at least I want to give you a little bit of an outlook of how this goes. But the main topic today is to try to understand what the correlation functions of the symmetric orbifold are and how they are reproduced from the world sheet perspective. Okay, so, so let's get started very slowly again. So let's first start with the symmetric orbifold. So this has nothing to do with ADS-CFT. Just uh, think about the symmetric orbifold. Remember, this is T4n to the Sn over Sn. So you take n copies of a T4 theory and you divide it by the orbifold group, which is the symmetric group. And then as I explained before, there is a, like with every orbifold theory, there's an untwisted sector, which basically consists of all the permutation invariant combinations that you can make out of the T4 to the n theory, and then there are twisted sectors, and the twisted sectors are associated to the conjugacy classes of the symmetric group. Remember, this is the cycle shapes, and then the uh, the the analog of the single trace operators are the things you are going to see by looking at a single world sheet theory are going to be the states that come from the single cycle sectors, i that have one non-trivial cycle of length w, say and all the remaining cycles are of length one. So it's, these are all the permutations that are conjugate to a cyclic permutation of order W. That's what it means, to a single cycle cyclic permutation of order W. <clears throat> and as, I've, uh, as we've seen before, this W cycle twisted sector, from the point of view of the world sheet theory, will correspond to spectral flow W. But for the first uh, half an hour or so, we are just going to talk about the symmetric orbifold and from the point of view of the symmetric orbifold, you don't know anything about spectral flow. The only thing you know is that you have this W cycle twisted sectors. Now, the question is, how do you calculate correlation function of states that sit in this W cycle twisted sector? And to start with, uh, we can ask, what are the sort of uh, fusion rules? I mean, what are the, so the fusion rules is just a euphemism for saying, what are the three point functions that are non-zero if I pick three states from the W1 cycle twisted sector, the W2 cycle twisted sector, and the W3 cycle twisted sector. And in the symmetric orbifold, the fusion rules are given by these two rules. So the sum over all the Ws must be odd. This just me, I mean, this is just the, if W is odd, then it's an even permutation. And the sum over the Ws must give you an even permutation because the permutations have to multiply up to give you the identity. 
Otherwise, the correlator can't be trivial, uh, can't be non-zero. So the, the sum over the W has to be odd. And then you get this constraint that any W minus one must be less or equal than the, the sum of the other Ws. So for example, W1 minus one must be less or equal than W2 plus W3, but this must be true for all triplets. I mean, for whichever one you pick to stand on the right-hand side. So these are the fusion rules of the symmetric orbifold. And for example, they allow always the three-point function of the form WWW, where W is odd. That's one three-point function that always exists. And because you see, it clearly is uh, three odd numbers is odd. And uh, the sum of two Ws is always bigger than, I mean, if all the Ws are the same, this first condition is trivially satisfied. So if you interpret this, I mean, looking a little bit ahead, if you interpret it from the point of view of the world sheet, what this means is that uh, you must have uh, correlation functions on the world sheet that violate the spectral flow or the winding number. So this is more a comment to people who know a little bit about the history of this subject. So people used to believe that you can only violate winding number by plus and minus one. And therefore, this seemed to be totally at odds with the structure of the correlation functions of the symmetric orbifold. But this is a, a side comment which you can ignore if you, don't, if you haven't heard about it. But there's a long history of a discussion about that the correlators on the SL2R versus amino witten model only have a winding number violation of plus and minus one, in which case this would not be compatible with this answer. Because you see here, the winding number violation means that, uh, that this, the third one is not equal to the sum of the other two plus or minus one. I mean, there are such correlators, but they wouldn't account for all of them. And in fact, the um, so, so this correlator, which is non-zero in the symmetric orbifold, would not be able to be reproduced from the symmetric from the world sheet theory. So this is this is sort of the state of the art before what I'm about to explain to you now. So at that stage, it looked as though this was totally hopeless that this identification of the of the cycle length with the uh, spectrally flowed sector could uh, could work because the correlating correlators would not be reproduced. Okay, so, so let's, let's be super explicit. So what's the simplest example of a non-trivial three-point function in the symmetric orbifold? Well, let's take a three-cycle twist detector for all three fields. And then I claim that there is a correlator of this kind that is non-zero. And what does this mean? Well, it means I have to find a, a, a three-cycle permutation here and a three-cycle permutation here and a three-cycle permutation here. But remember, twist detectors are labeled by conjugacy classes. So they needn't be the same three-cycle twist detector. They could be any three-cycle twist detector that are involve any number of, uh, of, uh, of numbers inside, such that the product of the three is equal to non-equal to zero, because you see the, the, the orbifold group invariance requires that the product of these strings, once you fuse them, produces something that uh, has a trivial permutation, because that's what the vacuum out at infinity is like. Now, obviously, you could take all three of these uh, cycles to be the same cycle. And for a three-cycle permutation, if you multiply three, three cycles together, obviously, you get the identity if you take the same one. But actually, that's, that's in some sense not the most interesting. That's not the most fundamental solution for a reason that I'll explain in a little while. But the solution we'll be mainly interested in is the solution where, say, you pick this guy to be the permutation one, two, three, this guy to be the permutation three, two, four, and this guy to be the permutation three for one. And then the product of these three permutations is trivial. So if you start from the right, so one goes to two, two goes to four, four goes to one, and so on. So you can check that this product of permutations is indeed uh, the trivial permutation and therefore this three point function is allowed. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the three point function, which is of that kind. So these things really exist and therefore we have to understand their structure, and we have to see how they can be compatible with the world sheet theory. Okay, so what's the what's the smart way of calculating twisted sector correlators in the symmetric orbifold? And uh, so, so there's one trick which I think was invented by Lunin and Matur, uh, and that will be very important for what we are going to do. And the idea is so 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 what remember what does it mean to have a W cycle twist detector. What it means is that you have a field, and then when you take the, in, I mean, this is the this is the, the the ground state of the W cycle twist detector, 
And then remember when we take, uh, say the boson around it, the boson XA, once it's gone around, it becomes the boson dex A plus one. And you do this W many times. And after W many iterations, you go back. So the, if you think of dx being just one field, then it wouldn't be single valued around that point, but it becomes single valued if you go to the lift to a covering surface that covers that point W uh, fold the W many times. So you should think of it, you want to go to the surface that looks like the multi-story car park, where if you go around with the car, you reach the next level and you do this W many times, except it's a magical car park, which means that when you reach the top level, actually you are back at the bottom. So it's identified after W many steps. The, those car parks don't exist in real life, but in the theory of complex surfaces, such surfaces exist. So, so the, the effect of this uh, of this of this uh, of this uh, W cycle twisted uh, field means that locally around it, I really want to go to the covering surface where I undo the effect of this uh, of this monotromy, so that once I've gone to this covering surface, the field dxa will be single valued, and that you see is also essentially what this winding W fold winding means. So this is the natural picture to think about this W cycle twisted sectors. Now, what you want to do is you want to do this near each point. So near, near each insertion, you want to look at a map that has the property, uh, I mean, so, so, so the, the Zs live up here, the X lives, live down there, and you're going to look at a map where a Z goes to, so from, from, from top to bottom, Z goes to gamma of Z, where gamma of Z maps Z0 to X0, so that's the point where this, uh, where this uh, field sits, uh, and correspondingly where the field sits on the covering surface, plus, uh, the, so the first order term is uh, some number times z minus z0 to the w, so you cover the w many times. As you go once round the covering surface, you go w many times round downstairs, and thereby you unwind this, uh, this monotony. So, so the idea of calculating these uh, correlators is, that locally you should do this. And then the idea is that you simply patch together these local conformal transformations and you do this near every insertion point of your W cycle twisted sector. So suppose you have a sphere with some insertions, then you're going to try to find the, the, the conformal transformation to some surface where near each of this point, you have a W fold cover. And if you manage to do that, if you find a holomorphic map that has this property, that's what you call the covering map. The covering map is simply the map that locally looks like such. And it simply does this near all the points where you've inserted the W cycle twisted the field. I mean, it need, the Ws needn't all be the same. Whatever they are near each of the Ws, you introduce the corresponding W fold cover and you patch this together into a Riemann surface. So you're asking what's the Riemann surface such that I have a colomorphic map downstairs that locally near each of these special points looks as such. That's the covering surface. And the idea is that you calculate the correlation functions of the twisted sector fields downstairs by simply applying the conformal transformation to move them upstairs, to move them to the covering surface. Now, why, why is that a smart idea? Well, you see, it's a smart idea because once you've gone to the covering surface, in some sense, you've undone the effects of these twisted sector fields. And as I'll explain in a second, if they were just a twisted sector ground state, the correlator upstairs will just be the vacuum correlator. But before I get, get to that, let's review the example we were thinking about, the example of the 333 field. What would the covering map look like in that case? And what I claim is that the covering map would be given by this formula. So gamma of Z is a map. So what is this? So there's a sphere here, which is the Z sphere. There's a sphere here, which is the X sphere. There's a map uh, which goes down gamma of Z. There are three special points here, zero, one, and infinity. There's uh, three special points here, zero, one, and infinity. And obviously three points I can always, without loss of generality, take to be zero, one, and infinity. And what this map does, it has the property that zero gets to zero, one gets to one, and infinity gets to infinity. And near each of the points, it behaves uh, as such. And I claim the solution of that, 
and the solution is characterized by the property there are no other special points. So the only special points where there is some covering are the 3.01 and infinity. And at each of those, you have a threefold covering. And I claim the, the unique map that has the, the unique map from the sphere to the sphere that has this property that map zero to zero, one to one, and infinity to infinity is a gamma of z being equal to z to the four minus two z cubed divided by one minus two z. And uh, this is a fourfold covering. So you see near each of the points, you have a threefold covering, but in order to patch it globally together so that you get a map from the sphere to the sphere, you need what's sometimes called four active colors. I, you need a fourfold covering so that the three covering at one and the three covering at the other are glued together in such a way that you get a globally defined holomorphic map from the sphere to the sphere. So, so I claim that this is the, this is the correct formula. And uh, it's not difficult to check that this is the correct formula. So what you have to do, so for example, you have to ask, what does this do near z equal to zero? So near z equal to zero, the leading term is uh, this term and this term. So it goes like minus two z cubed. So that has the property that maps zero to zero and the first order non-trivial term goes like z cubed. There is no lower order term. I mean, it's obvious they have a z cubed term, a z to the four term. And then if you expand out the denominator, you have higher order terms but there's only, there's no z squared term or, or linear term in z. So it behaves as such near zero. And if you work it out, what it does near one, it has this form near one. So again, it maps a one to one because if you said z equals to one, obviously all of these terms go. So it maps one to one, but the next order correction term is minus two times z minus one cubed plus higher order terms. And it finally maps infinity to infinity again with a cubic covering. So what, what does this mean? Well, what you do is you change coordinates from infinity to zero by introducing the variable one over u, and then you take gamma to the minus one evaluated at one over u. So you go, you apply one over one over z and one over x both upstairs and downstairs. And then you ask, then it should map zero to zero and have a cubic pole, a cubic order a zero. And that's exactly what you get. So, I mean, this is maybe not, I mean, it depends on how good you are at this, whether you can spot that this has this property, but it's not difficult to plug this into Mathematica and to convince yourself that these identities are true. And therefore this map ticks all the boxes that it has to tick in order to describe this sort of covering map, which is a threefold covering at each of these three points. So that's the simplest example of, uh, of, of such a non-trivial covering map. And it doesn't look too scary, right? I mean. For the covering maps that are maps from the sphere to the sphere, this is just going to be a ratio of polynomials. So nothing too fancy happening. And then, as I was alluding to before, the idea is that, uh, for example, if you just calculate the, the, uh, the correlator that involves the, the W cycle twisted the sector ground state, then once you've gone to the covering surface, you've basically undone the effect of this W cycle twist and then there's nothing left behind. I mean, the, the, if there was an excitation on top of the ground state, you would end up with field upstairs. But if it's the ground state, then by undoing the geometry of the twist, you basically remove the field. And therefore, what you have to calculate is the vacuum correlator upstairs. So, so therefore, the entire information about the correlation function is captured by the covering map itself. You just get the conformal factor associated to the covering map. The conformal factor you can calculate by some sort of Liouville term where you apply it for the field e to the phi is a EZ of the covering map uh, modulus squared. And that will spit out for you the correlation function of the, of the, of the twisted sector ground states. So the, the, the strategy is in order to calculate the correlators of the twisted sector ground states, you lift it up to this at this stage, fictitious surface. I mean, you just invent the surface as a way, as a means of calculating this correlator. And all the information is contained in the covering map in this holomorphic map. And then the correlation function can be calculated from this holomorphic map by just calculating the conformal factor that comes from it. And that calculates for you the correlation function of the W cycle twisted sector ground states. So that was the idea of Lunin and Matur. And that's the idea that we'll also be using in order to describe the um, correlation functions of the symmetric orbit. 
So for example, for the case of the three-point function, if you do this in a general case, uh, you, you pick a sigma w, so if there are w1, w2, w3, as I said, for the three-point function, the x and the z dependence is trivial because you, by a Möbius transformation, you can pick them to be zero, one, and infinity. Then this correlation function, if you go through this process, is basically just fixed in terms of these coefficient ai gammas that appear here, which for the case we were discussing earlier, were all equal to minus two. So in this example, they are equal to minus two, but in general, they depend on the choice of the w's in some vaguely complicated manner. And then if you trace through this conformal factor, that's the answer you get, say, for the three-point function of a symmetric orbifold twisted sector, a correlator of twisted sector ground states. And this just reflects the fact that everything is fixed by the uh, geometry of the covering map. And the geometry of the covering map is essentially encoded in these coefficients AI gamma. Okay, so that's basically the the, the uh, correlators as you calculate them on the symmetric orbital side. Now here, so you may ask, uh, so, so in general, there's more than one covering map, right? So suppose I have some surface and some twisted sector fields, I can ask uh, which covering map should I consider? And there are in general different ones. And in particular, the covering surface that you produce by going, by, by going through this process needn't be a sphere again. You'll always be interested in calculating the correlation functions of the symmetric, the symmetric orbifold will always live on the sphere, but this fictitious surface that's introduced in the process of calculating the correlators needn't be a sphere. It can be a genus G surface. And what was observed uh, by Luna and Matur, and in particular by uh, Pakman, Rastelli, and Razamat is that the one over N behavior of the, so, so think about, we are, we are talking about the, at the Tn mod Sn symmetric orbifold. So we are, we are talking about T4 to the n mod Sn. And we are thinking of this in the limit n large. So we can ask what's the n dependence, what's the one over n behavior of the correlation functions of the symmetric orbifold. So if you look at some schematically of the, of the, uh, the orbifold, uh, of the twisted sector states in the symmetric orbifold, you calculate this correlator by this means then if you trace through the one over n dependence, you see that the one over n dependence, well, it has some uh, scaling behavior depending on the number of points, but then it's essentially characterized by the genus of this fictitious surface that uh, contributes uh, to this correlator. So I I'll explain in a second how you should think about the different uh, covering maps. In some sense, you have to sum over all of them and I'll explain that in a second. But if you just concentrate on the contribution from a single covering map, then the contribution of the single covering map will have a one over n dependence that's essentially determined by the genus of what this covering surface is. And this is obviously extremely suggestive because if you think ahead about how this should be translated to the ADS uh, dual description, you want to think of the string coupling constant as being related to one over the square root of n, but this is the n of the symmetric orbifold that we're taking large. And therefore, this looks as though that this genus should be identified with the genus of the corresponding world sheet contribution, because the world sheets contribute with a G string to the 2G. So therefore, the, the world sheet of higher genus would reproduce exactly this N dependence if the genus of the world sheet can be identified with the genus of this fictitious covering surface that has just here appeared. I mean, as from the point of view of the symmetric orbifold, we don't know anything about world sheets. We are just calculating correlation functions in symmetric orbifold. But the smart way of calculating them is by introducing these covering surfaces. And the genus of the covering surface somehow wants to be identified with the genus of the world sheet that contributes to the calculation of the correlate. So that's a very strong hint that this, that well, what it suggests is that in some sense, you should think of as the covering surface as being the world sheet. Somehow what this N dependence tells you is that this covering surface, which initially seems to be something fictitious, probably wants to end up being identified with the world sheet of the dual ADS. And this is indeed what we will see will be happening. But I'm jumping ahead a little bit of myself, but you, you'll see how this comes about. And in particular, at this stage, this is a bit of a vague statement and I'll explain this in more precisely what I mean by this. 
Okay, so so let me a little bit more specific about what the symmetric orbifold correlators look like. So suppose you calculate a correlation function of a symmetric orbifold uh, uh, in, in the symmetric orbifold, and these are the vertex operators of the, um, the these are the twisted sector fields with some conformal dimension. Then the, what you expect on general grounds is that you're going to get the sum over all covering surfaces times the conformal factor associated to gamma. And uh, so if I was a bit more, more explicit here, I would also have an X bar here, which would be the right movers. And then I would get the conformal factor modulus squared, once from the left movers and once from the right movers. And the idea is that the different covering maps are the different conformal blocks that contribute to this correlation function. And I have to sum over all of the conformal blocks and take the same conformal block for the left movers and the right movers to get the actual correlation function of the symmetric orbifold. So, so that's the picture. So therefore, these correlation functions will involve a sum over all the covering surface. There will be, a, say, a covering surface of genus zero. There will be one of genus one, one of genus two, whatever. As we'll see, the genus is, uh, there are only finitely many genera that can contribute. There are only finitely many covering surfaces or covering maps that exist. And this uh, correlation function you can write as a sum over all of these different contributions. And these different contributions will involve, in general, Riemann surfaces of genus G, not necessarily of the sphere. And in each case, this covering map is characterized by this local property. That's the sort of defining property that near the insertion point of the, of the lifted point, it has this uh, branching, this uh, monotony by of order W. And then the idea is that the actual correlator will be the sum over all the conformal blocks, left and right combined. And, uh, and, uh, and in particular, it will have contributions from different covering maps and different genera. So there is not just a fixed gen genus for a given correlator. For a given correlator, there will be, in general, different covering maps of different genera that will contribute. And the picture is that a different genera will, the different contributions will have different 1 over n dependencies. And therefore, we would expect them to come from a world sheet perspective from world sheets of different genus because via this dictionary, that's what the, would reproduce correctly the one over n dependence. Okay, so, so what's the basic idea of how this, uh, how this should go? The basic idea is that the contribution where the covering service is genus G comes from a world sheet of genus G. And how could this come about? Well, what this should mean, and here I'm uh, restricting myself to the local part, but it basically it's going to, you're going to glue left and right movers together. So de facto, this will just be two copies of it. So the idea is that the chiral world sheet correlators, where I write down the vertex operator that produces the state, the, 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 the symmetric orbifold state corresponding to the cycle W and inserts it at position XI on the space time sphere. But remember, that, world, that vertex operator will also depend on zi, which is the coordinate on the world sheet. So, 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 so think about it. So here we have the x space. This is where the symmetric orbifold is. This is where we have our three points. And then the covering surface will be the function of z. And on the covering surface, so this surface we now want to identify with the world sheet. So on the world sheet, we'll have vertex operators that depend separately on x, which is the position where you insert the field downstairs, but they also depend on Z, which is the position upstairs. Because in the string theory, you see for every state, you're going to get a vertex operator that's a, that depends on Z. So, so and what you have to do in order to do the string theory calculation, you will have to do the integral over the, mod, over the world sheet moduli over all the insertion points. I mean, in general, you may also have to integrate over the modular parameters of the surface, say, if the world sheet is a torus, you also would have to integrate over tau. But say on the sphere, you'll just have to integrate over n minus 3 of the, of the zi's. And the idea is that once you integrate them, these correlators should produce for you the sum over, I mean, they, they should produce the sum over the uh, conformal factors. I, they should produce for you this piece. And what it suggests is, that the correlators themselves, i.e. the integrand here, should have a delta function such that when you do this integral, you just land on the sum of covering surfaces. So that's the, that's the natural picture that suggests. What it suggests is that the world sheet correlators 
should have some rather remarkable structure. They should be proportional to delta functions where you get a delta function in the zi, i in the coordinates that live upstairs, and the delta function is such that it restricts the, del the z to those configuration for which the holomorphic covering map exists. So, so that's the idea. The idea of what this picture suggests, and at the moment I've started from the symmetric orbit fold and I'm making a prediction for what the world sheet theory should do, and then we are going to go and check whether the world sheet theory does what it does. But what this train of thought suggests is that the world sheet correlators should basically be sums over the covering surfaces. Well, if, if, you, if you fix the genus, then you're only going to, going to get the covering, uh, you're only going to get the covering maps uh, corresponding to that, uh, to that uh, genus covering surface. And, but the, 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 the correlator should be proportional to a delta function where the zi's are, are, low, are, are fixed by the condition that they are compatible with the holomorphic covering map so that when you do the integral of the z, you just get the sum over the covering maps. Now, this sounds a bit strange. And the reason it sounds a bit strange is because why should there be a delta function for the zi's to be compatible, compatible with the covering map? So, so let me explain to you why that is actually a very natural concept. The reason this is a very natural concept is that generically covering maps don't exist. So what I mean by that, suppose I fix for you, I, 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 I say the covering surface say is a sphere, and downstairs I'm also at a sphere, I fix uh, say endpoints here, and I fix endpoints here. So I, I fix the zi's, I fix the zi's, I fix the xi's, and I fix the branching indices wi's, then generically a covering map won't exist. There won't be any holomorphic map that will map this point to this point, this point to this point, and so on, such that around each of them it has a monotony of order wi. What you can do is you can always, if you just give me the z's, you can, and you give me the branching numbers, I can always find a map of this form. I can always find a holomorphic map that maps the sphere to the sphere that has this property, but I can't guarantee that the image of each of these points lands on a given xi. I'll, I'll explain to you in a second how much freedom I still have if I demand this property. But the, the, the key point is that if I fix both the z's and the x's and the wi's, then generically a solution won't exist. So therefore, uh, this is the reason why there are only isolated points up here that are compatible with the existence of a holomorphic covering map once I've specified the x's and the w's. Because if I choose an arbitrary collection of z's up here, then a holomorphic covering map will not exist. And the idea is that this correlation function will be localized to those configurations for which the holomorphic covering map exists. That's the picture that we want to advocate. And then when you do the integral, you just uh, pick up the corresponding z that's compatible with the covering map, and therefore you just end this integral turns into a sum and you reproduce the structure of the symmetric orbifold correlators. Now, maybe, maybe this is still not very obvious to you why this, uh, why this should be so. So let's look at a super simple example. Let's look at a four point function where all the w's are equal to one. So what this means is we have four points down here, one, two, three, four. We want to have four points up here, one, two, three, four. And w equals to one means that this map is locally one-to-one. -one. There is no branching around anything. So what this means, it must be a Möbius transformation. I mean, there is no covering here because around each point, the first order term is the constant term. So therefore, this must be a Möbius transformation. But if I specify the x's and the z's, then I know that a Möbius transformation will generically not exist. Because as you know, you can always find a Möbius transformation that maps any three points to any three points. but you can only map four points to four points if the corresponding cross ratios exist, uh, coincide. Or put differently, I can use the Möbius symmetry to arrange for the first three points to map to the first three points by just applying the appropriate Möbius transformations up there and up there. And but once I've done that, I've used up my freedom as regards Möbius transformation. And then I get the covering map provided that the fourth point gets mapped to the fourth point. I don't have any freedom anymore because I've used up my Möbius symmetry 
to fix that the first three points get mapped to one another. And in fact, that sort of analysis uh, generalizes. So in general, you can always find, as I said, you can always find a covering map that has this property. And by using the Mobius symmetry, I can always arrange for the first three points to map to the first three points, because I just mapped them to say zero, one, and infinity, both upstairs and downstairs. But then this will only produce from you a covering map, but then I don't have any freedom left. And then the only, then this will produce a covering map, provided that gamma of zi is equal to x and i. So what I meant by this uh, slightly, uh, slightly uh, maybe vague statement is that if I choose to pick the covering map that has this property and this property, then I should expect my correlation functions to involve n minus four delta functions, which are basically xi is a minus gamma of zi, where gamma of zi is the covering function in quotation mark that has this property and that has the property that it correctly works on the first three points, which I can achieve by Möbius symmetry, but then the remaining points, I have no control over anymore and they either work or they don't work. And if they work, then I have a covering map. And if they don't work, then I don't have a covering map. So that's the delta function localization constraint. I would, I would postulate my world sheet correlation function should have so that the integral over the world sheet moduli. So, you know, on the sphere, if you integrate an endpoint function because of the Möbius symmetry, you really only have to integrate over n minus three points. And then the n minus three points, the zi, you would integrate over this delta function would sort of localize this integral. So this integral will turn into a sum and it'll just be a sum over covering maps and thereby it'll reproduce the structure of the symmetric orbital correlate. Okay, so that's that's the picture, which is if you start from the symmetric orbit fold and you and you think about how could this possibly be realized from a world sheet perspective, that's the sort of picture you end up with. And now the question is, is this really true? I mean, what I've explained to you in the previous two lectures is that we have a concrete world sheet theory that's meant to reproduce the symmetric orbit fold. So we can check this, right? So what we have to do is we have to calculate these correlation functions in our world sheet theory, and we should check whether they have this property. And if they do, then we would say that's very strong evidence that they reproduce the structure of the symmetric orbit fold. But you know, this is far from obvious that's true. And in fact, that's a pretty remarkable behavior for a CFT correlator. And certainly not the sort of CFT correlators I've been used to as people probably know 2D CFT correlators are typical rational functions. I mean, you don't typically find delta functions in your 2D CFT correlators, but somehow if this picture is meant to work out, that's somehow what you have to get. It's also pretty orthogonal to the sort of correlation functions people had previously written down for the SL2R Resumino Witten model. So somehow there must be something pretty non-trivial happening in order for this to work. So this is what I want to explain to you in the sort of uh, second half of this uh, lecture, namely how can we understand, I mean, can we see whether this is true by studying the world sheet theory and what we'll have to do, I'll first explain to you a smart way of characterizing the covering map. Then I explain to you, and this is in some sense a critical point, how exactly one should define the vertex operators on the world sheet. And then I'll explain to you that one can do a, a, a word identity analysis on the world sheet that effectively proves this statement. Now I should say that, so at this stage, we haven't quite managed to calculate this. So there are some additional leftover functions and so on. So we haven't quite milked all the properties of these correlation functions and there are subtleties about picture changing and all the rest of it. So there are many aspects of these correlators which we don't yet have under full control. And it'll be very interesting to really tie this down and check that you reproduce exactly what the symmetric orbifold predicts. We have so far tried to understand that it produced the structure of the symmetric orbifold correlators, i.e. this delta function, which means that you end up with the sum over covering surfaces or covering maps, which you know the structure of the symmetric orbifold correlators have. So that's what we are aiming for at this stage. So we, we don't have a full understanding of it, but I can explain to you why these delta functions occur and how they occur. And that's what I want to do in the second half of this lecture. Are there any questions about this?
Okay, so 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 let's uh, let's continue. So for a start, we are going to look at a sphere case. So we are going to restrict ourselves to the situation where the covering surface is also a sphere. You can look at it higher genus, but the sphere case is much simpler and already gives you all the interesting bits. Now, if you ask what's the covering from the sphere to the sphere that has a, these, uh, these uh, branching indices WI, then there's a mathematical formula, the so-called riemann hurwitz formula, that tells you the, the, uh, the degree of the, of the covering, i.e. how many pre-images every point downstairs has. And this degree is given by this formula. So remember, for the case of uh, if, that, if you have n equals to 3, and the wi equals to three, then this number is, you see three minus one is two divided by two is one. So I get three is equal to four. And this is the four active colors I was mentioning earlier. Remember, we, we had to involve four numbers in these three uh, permutations to multiply up to the identity. And that meant there were, or, or this explicit covering map that we saw earlier was a fourfold cover. It went like z to the four minus two z cubed divided by one minus two z. So remember this, uh, this looked like, um, so this was a fourfold covering. So this is, uh, this is just the general formula. If I do this for n points with uh, branching indices wi, then that's the general number of uh, pre-images. Now, if I think about this from the sphere to the sphere, then this covering map, is going to be a, a, a ratio of polynomials. And because it has uh, n pre-images, it's generically a ratio of polynomials of degree n divided by a, a polynomial of degree n. So for example, here we have a, deg a degree four polynomial in the numerator, and we have a, well, it's a very special degree four polynomial in the denominator, namely it happens to be degree one, but it's certainly within the family of degree four polynomials. And in general, this covering map will always be, for the case of the sphere, a polynomial of order n divided a polynomial of order n, where n is the number of pre-images, which is given by the riemann hurwitz form. So that's the structure of the covering map. And in fact, that's the way you can find it, right? So you make the ansatz for this, and then you have a certain number of free parameters. I mean, in fact, you can count the parameters. So how many parameters? Well, you have a, a degree n polynomial as n plus one parameter. So you have two n plus two parameters. But in fact, you only have, uh, there's the overall scale that drops out. So you have a minus one, so you have two n plus one parameters. That's uh, your ansatz will have a two n plus two n plus one parameters. And now you have to demand that this is a covering map. So what does this mean? Well, remember the covering map property means that gamma of uh, zi of a z near z i should go like x i plus uh, some number times z minus z i to the w i. That's the covering space property. And if you plug this in here, you see this property is just the this property. If p minus, so the numerator has plus x times the denominator should be of order z minus z i to the w. So if you divide this by if you divide this equation by minus one over Pn plus, then this becomes minus uh, Pn plus, this becomes minus, and this becomes order Z minus Zi. So this is exactly this property. Normal of degree N in the numerator and the denominator. So then you have two N plus one parameters, and then you have to impose uh, all of these relations so let me remove this so I can see them. So how many relations do I get from here? Well, at each point I get, uh, I get uh, WI relations. So this is uh, I is equal to, I is equal to one to N um, WI. And then I can, I can uh, simplify this formula. So the sum over WI what is this? If I multiply through, this is a 2n minus 2 plus, uh, uh, plus n, right? So this uh, number is actually equal to 2n minus 2 plus n. And now you see the constraint. 
you see you have uh, you have two n plus one parameters that you can put into your answer. So that gives you a map from the sphere to the sphere, but you have two n minus two plus n constraints. So if n is bigger than, if n is equal to three, you have exactly as many constraints as you have parameters. But if n is bigger than three, you have more constraints than parameters. And that means you get additional constraints on the x size. So generically, the covering map will not exist if n is bigger than three. And what you expect is that you get a, a, the co-dimension is n minus three. So that's why you should expect n minus three delta functions to characterize the locus where the covering map exists. Anyway, so this is a smart way of writing the covering map and we shall be using that in the following. So the covering map will write as a polynomial divided by a polynomial both of order n and these uh, have to satisfy this condition in order to define the covering map. Okay, that's just the, a smart way of uh, describing these uh, covering maps. Now, the key step in understanding of how and why this, uh, this world sheet theory reproduces it is to define exactly what the vertex operators in this world sheet theory look like. And, and this, is a, this is the critical point. And I think, I mean, I think in Maldesino Augori in their third paper, it's sort of implicit, but people hadn't really taken into account the quite, quite the significance of it. And I'll explain to you why this is so significant and why it changes things so dramatically. So what's the idea? So suppose you were to set, sit at z equal to zero and x equal to zero. And suppose, so in conformal field theory, as you know, there is a field state correspondence and you can basically pick a point where you identify the vertex operator with the state. The idea being the vertex operator on the vacuum evaluated that point is equal to the state. So let's for definiteness say the point where we identify fields and states is zero both for the world sheet and for the target space. Rem remember we have two variables here. So we have, we have the world sheet. So the world sheet is whatever is the world sheet is a Z. And then we have the target space. This is the sphere at infinity. That's where the where, where T form what SN lives. That's uh, X. And what we have to do is, so this vertex operator describes the insertion of the corresponding state at position X in this space. And it's a function of the coordinate here, which is Z. And what I'm saying is that let's say at Z equal to zero and X equal to zero, we identify fields and states. So therefore uh, the vertex operator associated to that state is just the state. I mean, if I think of it as applying to the vacuum, just producing that state, it's that characterizes this vertex operator. Now, if we know what the vertex operator does at one point in Z, we always know what it does at any point in Z because we have a translation symmetry on our world sheet. And you know how vertex operators behave as a function of Z, they just get translated along. But the translation operator is just e to the minus, e to the Z to L minus one, where L minus one is the world sheet Mobius symmetry. So here on the world sheet, I have the generators L0, L plus and minus one. And I know that if I conjugate my vertex operator at zero by e to the Z L minus one, then that's going to produce for me the vertex operator at point Z. That's a general fact about 2D CFTs. Okay, so that's true on the world sheet. But you see, the target space is also a 2D CFT. And there, I should do exactly the same. There, the vertex operator should also depend on the coordinate in exactly the same manner as it does on the world sheet, except that I have to use the Möbius symmetry associated to, 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 to here. So what are the Möbius symmetry generators here? Well, remember they are to be identified with the zero modes on the world sheet. And in particular, the L minus one space-time generator, the translation operator in space-time is just equal to J plus zero as regarded from the SL2R on the world sheet. So therefore the the, uh, the X dependence is controlled by conjugation with E to the X J plus and E to the minus X J plus. And there isn't really any ambiguity about it because both the world sheet and the 2D and the target space are 2D CFTs. And you know how vertex operators depend on the insertion point in a 2D CFT. They just get conjugated by the corresponding translation operator. You should also note that L minus one commutes with J plus 
j plus zero because the zero mode of a current commutes with the Verasoro generators. So therefore, this makes perfect sense. You are in some sense free to change the z coordinate and the x coordinate, and they don't interfere with one another. These are two things you can choose independently of one another. And it's clear based on general principles of 2D CFTs that that's how the vertex operator has to depend on X and Z. There's really no choice. I mean, what this vertex operator, this one is, I, I have to define by saying on the vacuum, it produces the corresponding state. But whatever it is, the X and the Z dependence is entirely fixed simply by general principles of 2D CFTs. And there is no, no, no debate about what it could be. Okay. so. So this is this factor is enormously important, as you'll just see in a second. And that's somehow, as I said, is in, contained in Maldesin Auguri, the third paper. But somehow people didn't take this. It's also mentioned in this Kutas of Cyborg paper. But people haven't really taken this into account when calculating the correlation functions of the Resumino Witten model associated to SL2R. But for us, this will be the key player. This will play an absolutely crucial role, and in particular, it will interact with the spectral flow in a non-trivial manner. So now what's our strategy? What our strategy is, we want to use the board identities. So these are the vertex operators I've just defined, and we are interested in calculating the correlator of these vertex operator. And in order to constrain it, we are going to insert one of the symplectic boson free fields of our, so now we are doing this in the hybrid formalism, where we use the symplectic bosons that generate the SL2R factor of the hybrid formalism. Initially, we did this in the bosonic NSR setup, just using the currents of SL2R. That also works, but the analysis is somewhat more complicated and you won't see so easily why the answer is what it is. And it will be more easy to describe it in this fashion. Now there's one, if you want, so if we work in the Neve schwartz ramon sector description and we just use the SL2R currents, then that's all there is and there is no subtlety. But if we work in the hybrid formalism, we are manifestly working in a super string setup. And then there is an issue having to do with, uh, with uh, picture changing. So then you have to introduce picture changing operators. There is a prescription according to, uh, to uh, uh, Berkowitz and Waffer what the picture changing means in this hybrid formalism. But the upshot of it, I mean, apart from subtleties that really don't matter for the argument, is that you are somehow introducing a field that changes the U0 charge and you have to compensate that. And the upshot of this picture changing is that you have to introduce N minus two fields that are the SL2R vacuum, either invisible with respect to the SL2R symmetry, but they carry a non-trivial U0 charge where U0 is the central, is one of the U1s of the U1,1 slash two, that gets effectively quotiented out when you go to PSE. So it's a bit of a technical point, but we need these additional factors and they come effectively from picture changing. But the honest answer is, while this is, there is a relatively plausible way of believing that that's the right answer, it would be very satisfying to understand this picture changing and the exact form of the ghost part and so on in more detail that we haven't looked at. We are just trying to understand this delta function localization property. And for that, the only thing we need is in order to compensate this U1 zero charge that has effectively been shifted here, you need these vacuum fields. So now the aim of the game is to calculate these correlation functions. Yes. So normally when you change the location of the picture changing operator, you get total derivatives, right? Is that the case? Again, you, get, you, you get to a what? When you change the location of the picture changing operator, Yes. You get total derivative in the modular space. Yes. Is that the case here as well? I think so, yeah. I mean, you see this use, the correlator will not really depend on the use because it's really the vacuum. So it's, I mean, you can think of this as basically, so you have some G descendant that you have to put here, but where you put it, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's, uh, it's and, 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 and the location of these points is totally immaterial. Yeah. Okay, normally, it, it, uh, if you change the location, you get total derivatives. You are saying that's not the case here? Well, I, I mean, this is not all there is. I mean, so there is a G here. Right? I mean, so, 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 so in this picture, the picture, the picture changing, so there are two G uh, plus or G minus modes you, can, you have, because you have an N equals to four uh, a, a topological string here, and there's a G minus and a G minus tilde. 
And how many times you need to use G minus and how many times you need G minus tilde is basically picture changing. Picture changing means you replace a G minus by a G minus tilde. So the G minus tilde, um, so in, in, in the conventions with which we work, the G minus tilde has a, a non-trivial U zero charge and therefore you have to compensate it. So the G minus tilde comes together with a, with a sort of a fake vacuum that compensates the U zero charge. So one way to think about it is that the, the picture changing operator would be a certain descendant from here. And this descendant, when you wrap it around, will give you a derivative term, but you're left over with this sort of piece that just keeps track of the global U zero charge. And that is important in order for our analysis to work. Otherwise, you, all the correlators are zero simply by U zero charge conservation. I see. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, but I also openly admit that we haven't understood all the details of this. So it would be great if uh, somebody understood this in more detail. What we can see is that because of this U, I mean, remember this uh, PSU has this central, effectively central piece. And uh, yeah, it's a little bit subtle. It ha has to do with the fact that we are working with U1 comma one slash two, but the theory we're really interested in is P is U1 comma one slash two. And the simple way of writing this picture changing operator changes this, the, the sort of the U zero charge where you're working and then you have to compensate that. And th the way we describe it is by simply adding these vacuum fields. But I think there are other ways in which you can do it. Okay, thank you. Anyway, so, so, so the idea is that we are going to look at these correlators and we're going to insert these symplectic bosons fields into it. And we're going to analyze the structure of the correlator with the insertion of this psi plus minus. And this will lead to ward identities and that will then lead us to constraints for the correlators without the insertion of the xi plus, xi plus minus. So in order to understand this, what's important is to understand what's the OPE when xi plus minus gets close to these vertex operators. And, and this is where spectral flow now plays a, a very important role. So, 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 so how does this work? So, so remember, so the vertex operator is the vertex operator evaluated at zero, and then it's conjugated by this translation, both in target space and in space time. And I, I summarily uh, denote this by U of X and Z. So U of X and Z is just uh, this combination. So when I, when I bring this vertex operator close to this vertex operator, there's this U standing here, because that's the definition of the vertex operator as a function of W and Z. And now I have a, the Xi plus modes and the Xi plus modes, the Xi plus modes in fact, uh, essentially commute with the U. The only thing they do is the Z piece is responsible for this becoming a pole in zeta minus Z rather than a pole in zeta. So this will go like zeta minus z to the minus r minus a half, like a usual mode expansion of a spinner half field. And then you have the psi plus r mode acting on the state. But it doesn't care about the e to the x j plus mode, because remember j plus is, uh, j plus is proportional to psi plus and eta plus, and psi plus commutes with both psi plus and eta plus. So, so when you bring this field close, this uh, symplectic boson close to this vertex operator, you just bring it, the mode directly acts on the state. And the effect of this factor is just to move z to z minus zeta, uh, zeta minus z. And then we use the fact that uh, spectral flow means that in the spectrally flowed sector, it's defined to act in the shifted manner. And therefore, the, this, the, so therefore R has to be less or equal than W over two because this must be a zero mode or a negative mode. So the important uh, statement from here is that because this sum starts at uh, W over two, this will go as a zeta minus Z to the minus uh, W plus one over two. And the leading term will be uh, this term, psi plus zero M one and two, W evaluated at X and Z. And then there will be higher order terms. And uh, so, so this is just a familiar statement that it's not a highest rate representation. You see, if it was a highest rate representation, it would, uh, the, 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 the leading term would be r equal to zero. It would have a, well, it depends, in the Ramon sector, it would have a, a square root branch cut and, and so on. But because it's not highest rate and it's spectrally flowed, it has a higher order pole and the order of the higher order pole is controlled by this W. 
So that's relatively standard. That's pretty obvious what Xi plus does when you bring it next to this vertex operator. Now, the interesting thing is when you bring Xi minus next to this vertex operator. And now you see when you bring Xi minus past this, so what we have to calculate is Xi minus of zeta. And then we have to move it past e to the x j plus zero. And what you find is that this is equal to e to the x j plus zero times xi minus of zeta minus x times xi plus of zeta. And this is uh, due to the fact that, as I said before, j plus goes like xi plus eta plus. And you see there's a commutator term from the xi minus is the eta plus, and you pick up a term that goes like e xi plus. So the effect that you have, you've translated by e to the x j plus zero means that you're some, in some sense you're speculatively flowing in a slightly different direction. And therefore you pick up a correction terms as you move this field past the exponential out here that's proportional to psi plus. So therefore, when you calculate this OPE, so this term just makes sure that the zeta becomes a zeta minus z. But then inside here, you don't just have psi minus, you also have minus x times xi plus. Now the xi plus term we know, that just gives you minus x times xi plus, the OPE that we've calculated before. And this term, you see, this gets spectrally flowed the other way around. So you see here, r got shifted downwards by w over two, xi minus gets shifted upwards by w over two. So therefore this will start at r is equal to minus w uh, over two. And therefore this will go like, well, this will go like a term that goes like minus psi x plus of zeta times this vertex operator plus, and what's the leading term? The leading term is r is equal to minus w over two. So it'll go like order of zeta minus z times uh, uh, w minus one over two, right? So this is, this is the, the upshot and this is, but people somehow didn't quite appreciate before. I mean, you can do it for the size. You could equally do it in the SL2R Western mean written model. You just look, look at the J plus and J minus and J3. It's a little bit more complicated, but the spirit is exactly the same. But the effect of this exponential is that when you apply some of the modes, the, the, the modes that used to become very regular, so this is the mode that used to behave very regularly, actually also has a singular piece, which comes from the commutator of this Xi minus piece with the e to the x j plus, and you can easily calculate it. It's just equal to minus x times xi plus, the OP of xi plus with v. So therefore, you see, what this tells you is if you take this plus x times j plus, then it'll go like this. So this is the upshot of it. Xi minus plus x times xi plus of zeta, when you bring this close to the vertex operator, that is the combination that's very regular. If you, if you sit at x equal to zero, then this term drops, then it's the familiar behavior, psi minus behaves in a regular manner. But for a generic position of the, in space time of this vertex operator, it's not psi minus that's regular or highly regular, it's psi minus plus x psi plus, because psi minus produces this correction term as you move it past the exponential. So that's, that's the key effect that leads to an interesting structure of this correlation function. That's the key effect in which X and Z gets coupled together. So, so, so this is the behavior of Xi plus and Xi minus near this vertex operator. This combination is regular and Xi plus goes like a zeta minus Z to the minus W plus one over two. Furthermore, both Xi plus and Xi minus near this vacuum field uh, uh, have, a, have, a, have, a, have, a, have a zero. Um, and uh, and uh, as you can also check explicitly, and this is explained in this paper in detail. So now, in order to understand the structure of this correlator, what we are going to do, we're going to define these functions. So, so this is the correlator we are interested in. This is the field uh, psi plus and minus of zeta. Then we define functions that we call p plus minus of zeta, depending on whether you pick the plus mode or the minus field. Now, as we said, this is a, has, a, has a zero when the xi plus and minus hit w. So we remove the zeros by dividing by zeta minus u alpha and taking the product over all u alphas. 
And on the other hand, we know that individual these fields have a pole of order minus W plus one. This is this pole. So they behave, uh, so Xi plus has a pole of minus W plus one over two, and therefore Xi minus also does because it has a piece, at least generically, that has also this pole. So therefore, we are going to remove this pole by multiplying by zeta minus Zi to the Wi plus one over two, and where, is, where we take the product of all the i's. Now, what does this as a function of zeta now look like? Well, it doesn't have any poles anymore. You see, the only poles it could have had was when Xi goes to any of these or when Xi goes to any of these. Well, when Xi is going to any of these, it has zeros and we've just removed the zero, so it's now regular. And when Xi goes to any of these, it used to have poles of order Wi plus one over two, and we simply by hand remove them by multiplying with this prefactor. So this function doesn't have any poles as a function of zeta because we've designed the prefactors in such a way that the poles get removed. So therefore, if you think of it as a function of zeta, it must be a polynomial. So what's the degree of the polynomial? Well, so we have the prefactor. So, so this prefactor, so, so think about this, evaluate this for a very large zeta. So for a very large zeta, the degree you pick up this sum from the numerator, you pick this sum from the denominator, and we know how this correlator behaves when zeta goes to infinity. This correlator goes like zeta to the minus one as zeta goes to infinity, because zeta is a spinner half field and out at infinity, far away from any of these fields, it goes like zeta to the minus one. So therefore the degree of this polynomial is the sum over wi plus one minus uh, n minus two minus one. And if you work it out, it's exactly the degree of the covering of the polynomial that appeared in the covering. Remember, when I explained to you before, the, we can write any covering map as a ratio of polynomials where that's the uh, degree of the polynomial. So therefore, P plus and P minus are polynomials that have exactly the degree that we would expect for those polynomials that appear in the numerator and the denominator of the definition of the covering map. And furthermore, you see this condition now simply becomes the condition that P minus plus X times P plus is, uh, well, you, you have to multiply this factor with the corresponding factor from here. So therefore what you're going to get is that this goes like, um, this, uh, I mean, originally this goes like Zeta minus Zi to the Wi W minus one over two. This is uh, from here. And then this prefactor, which we have to multiply into it, means there's another order of zeta minus zi to the wi plus one over two. And therefore the product will go as p minus plus x times p plus goes like order zeta minus zi to the w. But that is exactly the condition that characterizes the covering map. Because remember, we make these ansatz, and then the condition for the covering map is exactly this condition. That's the condition that guarantees you that this ratio behaves as this property. So therefore, what we've managed to do is we can extract out of our world sheet uh, correlator, we can in fact construct the covering map, and the covering map is just the ratio of these polynomials where these polynomials are defined by these world sheet correlators. So, so that just follows from carefully keeping track of the structure of the OPEs and keeping track of how they depend on X and this subtlety with the E to the X J plus zero, which means that there is this interesting X dependence for these correlators. But if you now plug this back in, what this means is that you have this identity for the correlation functions of your theory, because you see, if I pull this out, this was a P minus, this was P plus, but gamma is just minus P minus over P plus. And therefore you have this identity as an identity for the correlation functions of your world sheet theory. This identity makes sense whenever the covering map exists, because you see, as I explained before, the covering map only exists on a co-dimension N minus two surface, a co-dimension N minus three surface, because these conditions 
there are more conditions than I have parameters here. So generically, I can't solve them. I can only solve them on a co-dimension n minus three place. So if I'm sitting at the point where the covering map exists, I know that this identity must be true because that's exactly what the xi minus and the xi plus correlators will give for me. But if I don't sit at a point where the covering map exists, something must go with, wrong with this construction because you see, I can basically construct the covering map out of these correlators. So what must go wrong is that the effect of the denominator or the numerator, in fact, both must be equally identically equal to zero. So if the current map doesn't exist, this must mean that this correlator must be equal to zero. But then if you trace through what uh, Xi plus does on these fields, you can show that that also means that a correlator without Xi plus must be equal to zero. So this proves, and then if you do this slightly more carefully, you can check that it's not just zero or non-zero, but that the behavior is really that of a delta function. So that shows that the correlation functions of the, our world sheet theory really have this structure. So, but we haven't quite shown, we don't, we haven't managed to calculate that. That you can sort of see, but basically we've, we've managed to show that these correlation functions, the way we've defined them, have this factor of the delta functions. They only exist whenever they are compatible with the covering map. And therefore, when you do the integral over the world sheet moduli, you're going to recover the sum over covering maps and therefore recover the structure of the symmetric orbifold correlators. So I think this is quite striking. I mean, this property is, is, is far from obvious. I mean, this is not something that's uh, baked into the cake or manifest from what we've done. It was more of a bit of a surprise that these correlators really have this property, but we've checked this in, in terms of this hybrid formalism, which is what I explained to you here. You can also check it more pedestrianly by just doing it directly in the NSR description and just using the word identities of SL2R and we reach exactly the same conclusion. So these world sheet correlators really are delta function localized and therefore they really produce at least the structure of the symmetric orbifold correlators. And that suggests very strongly that this world sheet theory is exactly dual to the symmetric orbifold. But obviously, we haven't checked all the details. In particular, we haven't really evaluated these correlators. We haven't kept carefully track of the ghosts, of the picture changing and all of that. So we haven't calculated the number. We've only understood that they have this localization property, which I think is highly non-trivial. It is very suggestive of it being related to a symmetric orbital correlator. But obviously, to really, the proof of the pudding should lie in really working it out and checking that it produces also the correct numbers. And that's not something we have done yet. Okay, so this is uh, uh, basically the, 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 and then, so to wrap up and then, uh, and then when you do this integral, basically that's just more, more or less manifestly reproduces it up to fixing these coefficients. And that is the main argument convincing us that this is really correctly reproducing the correlators and therefore exactly the correct world sheet description. Now I should say that this identity, we also think is sort of suggestive in another way, because it suggests a little bit that you should think of Xi minus and Xi plus as being twister valued, because then that this looks like a, the incidence relation in twister space. And this was something that motivated us in our attempt to generalize this to ADS5. And if I have, depending on whether people have questions here, I can try to sketch roughly how we believe this will generalize for the case of ADS5. But maybe I'll pause here and ask for questions about the, the correlators. Yes, there's a question in the chat box. The integral, integral of correlation function of vertex operators in ambitwister tensionless string is also localized to some variety. Could there be relations? Probably, I mean, so, so for us, this, this localization is really the incidence relation. It really tells you what X is. I mean, it really tells you where in the space-time coordinate that field sits. Um, I mean, here, it, but it, it, I mean, this theory surely looks like some sort of twister string theory. So probably there is a relation, but we haven't understood in detail how this links up with the more traditional literature on ambitwister or twister strings. But that would also be very interesting to, I mean, to couch this in a language that sort of 
makes contact with that literature, we haven't managed to do, but that would also be very interesting. Are there any other questions? No, I don't see any further questions. Okay, okay so then, then so I, I only have 15 minutes left and we are probably all a little bit tired. So let me just try to sketch how this works for ADS5. So, so the idea is somehow, so, so for ADS3 cross S3 cross T4, our world sheet theory was four symplectic boson and four, four fermions. And then we had the four T4 degrees of freedom, which was another set of four bosons and four, I mean, it's T4, I shouldn't say four T4. This is just one T4, but this is basically also, this is also four plus four bosons and fermions. This was basically the, the world sheet description in this hybrid formalism at level one. And as I've tried to indicate, somehow these size look a little bit like twister variables, so you could ask, what could be the answer for ADS5 plus S5? And so our bold proposal is that we should effectively remove, uh, well, there won't be a T4 because there is no space left. Once you've got ADS5 plus S5, there is nothing left. And what we believe is that instead of having four symplectic bosons and four fermions, you should simply have eight symplectic bosons and eight fermions. But otherwise, this theory will behave very similarly. Now, and finally, I want to motivate a little bit why that's maybe not so unreasonable. So the first piece of evidence that makes you suspect that this may be right is that, remember, the four symplectic bosons and the four fermions, they generated U1,1 slash 2 level 1. And U, and then you quotient it out by this U1, and then you've got P as U1, comma 1, slash 2, level 1. And P as U is what you would, should expect for string theory in ADS3 being dual to a N equals to 4 super conformal field theory in two dimensions, because the global symmetry of this is the global symmetry of the N equals to 4 super conformal field theory living on the boundary. Now, what should you expect for ADS5 cos S5? Well, the global symmetry of n equals to four super n mils in four dimensions is p as u 2 comma 2 slash 4. So if you believe that this sort of will follow a similar pattern, then you may think that on the world sheet you should have a p as u 2 comma 2 slash 4 at level 1 instead of p as u 1 comma 1 slash 2 at level 1. And p as u 2 comma 2 slash 4 at level 1, you can make from u 2 comma 2 slash 4 at level 1 by basically the same procedure by means of which you go from this from the u1, 1, 1 slash 2 to level 1 to p as u1, 1, 1 slash 2 at level 1. But how can you make u2, 2, 2 slash 4 at level 1? Well, it's basically the same construction as this one, except you double the fermions and the bosons. So that's the first order idea of what maybe this world sheet theory could be. And at least it won't, will have manifested the right superconformal symmetry in the target space. Just like this theory, more or less manifestly had the correct superconformal symmetry in the target space. Now, so when you write this out, what does this mean? So we're going to have uh, eight, uh, eight symplectic bosons, so they are four plus four, so they're going to be basically two plus two plus two plus two, so these are the eight symplectic bosons, and then four plus four fermions. So the symplectic bosons satisfy exactly the same commutation relations as before, except I have two copies of them, and then the fermions satisfy the usual fermionic relation, and if you look at this, this looks very much like the twister string theory Berkowitz proposed to describe n equals to four super mills many years ago, except that in his description, he also had some additional U1 field and he didn't have spectral flow. And so it's not exactly the same theory, but the ingredients from which he started look very much like these ingredients, which is striking given the fact that these ingredients seem to be the exactly parallel construction to what you do in ADS3 cross S3 if you want to get P as U2, 2 slash 4 instead of P as U1, 1 slash 2. So this seemed like a plausible idea that one should maybe consider the world sheet theory consisting of these fields. Now here, I should be clear right from the start. So in ADS3 cross S3, we got sort of motivated by the geometry of ADS3 cross S3. We go to this tensionless limit, then there's this free field realization. 
this free field realization has this subjective boson and fermionic description. And now we just generalize this free field realization. We have no idea how this is directly related to ADS5 cos S5. It's just the natural generalization of the ADS3 cos S3 world sheet theory with the right symmetry. So that, that's our working hypothesis. And uh, so here, here's just explaining to you how you get this PSU 2,2 slash 4. And it works exactly the same way as uh, for ADS3. You look at this by linears, where you take one of these and one of these. And then you have to, to gauge by some overall U1 field, which is the analog of what we call the Z field before. And then you get a PSU 2,2 slash 4. And the other thing that makes you feel that maybe you're on the right track is that this construction, this uh, U2,2 slash 4 construction, and the constraint by this, is really the current algebra version of the usual oscillator construction that people have used in the spin chain community to describe integrability for n equals to four super mil. So while we are not doing the integrable spin chain, the, the sort of mathematics of it is essentially a carbon copy, except we think of it as chiral fields on the world sheet. So we get some affine cuts Moody algebra rather than just the global. But apart from that, it's basically exactly the same construction. That also smells your making contact with some other part of n equals to four super mills, which maybe is also promising. Okay, so what's the new ingredient? Well, the new ingredient is that we, from an ADS3, all the interesting bits came from spectral flow. There are actually no physical state, there's some sort of spurious state in the, in the unflowed sector, but essentially all the physical states are, except for some probably non-normalizable state at W equal to zero, a single state, all these states come from W bigger than one. So you would expect that somehow something similar should happen here. And you can guess what's the correct, uh, what's the correct uh, spectral flow. And this is really guessed by analogy with what we did uh, for ADS3. So for ADS3, the spectral flow is really determined by the eigenvalue of J3 minus K3 zero, where J3 zero is the SL2 and K3 zero is the SU2 number. That told you whether the mode number goes up or down. That was always fixed. This was the eigenvalue that fixed whether the mode number went up and down. So what you should you do for ADS5? Well, the analog of J30 should be the dilatation operator in PSU 2,2 slash 4. And the analog of K30 should be some certain R symmetry generator in the, in the SU4 bit of PSU 2,2 slash 4. So if you do this, then this is, uh, this is what you get for the, for the prescription for spectral flow. That's just the natural analog of what we did for ADS3 equals S3. You just follow your nose and you add in the corresponding spectrally flowed sectors. And then you can describe these representations as before. They're not going to be highest weight. Here, it's somewhat more convenient to start with the Neve Schwartz sector and count everything with respect to the Neve Schwartz sector, but that's really not uh, very important. But when you do it, what you find is that the sort of half the modes uh, kill the ground state when R is greater or equal than W plus one over two, and half the modes kill the ground state when R is bigger than greater or equal than minus W minus one over two. That's just reflecting the fact that you have spectrally flowed by, by the amount W. And then, so the idea is that, uh, uh, so, so these are the modes that kill, and because these are free fields, but this means all the other modes uh, generate freely the Fox space. So therefore, from the first line, you get all the modes where the mode number is less or equal than W minus W plus one over, so it's less than W plus one over two or less or equal than W minus one over two because they go in integer steps. And for the second line, you get everybody who is less or equal than minus W plus one over two. So one way of saying it is you get from the first line, you get modes that lie inside this wedge, and then every mode acts uh, freely if the mode number is sufficiently negative, which is uh, less or equal than minus W plus one over two. And then the idea is, and that's obviously something that we understand even less well than the hybrid formalism for ADS3. So obviously now you would have to define some cohomology and explain what cohomology you should solve in order to characterize the physical states that we haven't managed to do. We are not sure exactly how that will go, but our intuition is that once the dust has settled, what should happen is that you just keep the wedge modes and all of the out of the, so these we call the wedge modes. So these are the modes that come from here. So these we call wedge modes because they lie inside this wedge. 
And then the rest are, we call out of the wedge modes. And the intuition is that the physical state condition will basically remove all of the out of the wedge modes and will just retain the wedge modes. And furthermore, you see here, I'm just describing the left movers. There'll be a similar construction for the right movers. And the idea is that there's only one copy of the combined left and right moving wedge modes that survives because the wedge mode should be thought of as some sort of generalized zero modes. So just like in normal string theory, you don't have separate zero modes left and right. Somehow the zero modes are glued together. And therefore these wedge modes, you should only retain one copy despite the fact that the full string theory obviously has left and right moving fields. There's some intuition from people analyzing this Berkowitz string theory and the classical solutions of it. But this is a postulate at this stage. We don't have a first principles derivation of this fact by, by, by a long shot. And then, so, so what we claim is that the physical state condition will remove these degrees of freedom, will retain one copy of these. And then there will be two residual gauge conditions left over. One is pretty obvious, the C condition. Remember, this is the condition that reduces U2,2 slash 4 to PSU2,2 slash 4. So that we still have to impose. And just like always, we just demand that the positive modes annihilate any state. And then there should be some sort of mass shell condition. And we claim the mass shell condition will take this form. I, the L0 eigenvalue must be a multiple of W when evaluated on that state. And there is some sort of BMN type motivation for it. But again, I mean, here, here we are a little bit on our own. These are postulates. We don't have first principles derivations of any of these facts. Now, the observation is, and that I think is quite striking, that if you buy this, if you look at one copy of these modes and you impose this condition and you impose this condition, then you reproduce exactly the single trace spectrum of free superhand mills in the planar limit. And that's something we can prove and that we've checked uh, in uh, enormous detail. So, so this, and this is non-trivial because I think in previous attempts of people writing down world tree theories, people didn't quite manage to get anything that really looked like the spectrum of free super mills. So here, admittedly, with some jumps in our argument for what you have to do to characterize the physical states, there's at least a roadmap that tells you how you're landing on the uh, degrees of freedom of free uh, super mills theory in four dimensions in a way that's at least plausibly quite natural to arise in a, in a world tree description. And it's a world sheet theory that's really the very natural higher dimensional analog of the successful world sheet description that worked for ADS3 equals history. So this makes us believe that this is the this is the right picture, but it's obvious from the way I'm describing it, there are many open problems that need to be resolved, and we are working on some of them, but this is a big problem, and we'll would be very happy for people to help in trying to establish various of these uh, various of these claims. Now, when I say that this reproduces the spectrum, the way you can prove it is that you go, so you, should, you want to think of these wedge modes as being the, <coughs> the, the momentum modes associated to W position space operators. So you, you, you define some inverse Fourier transformation uh, where you run over just these wedge modes, then these, these modes are, behave as though they, they, they look like they sit on, the, on a spin chain at different sites. And then this condition turns out to be <clears throat> uh, the cyclic invariance that, I mean, you have, you have W many sites at each of them, you have the, at each of them, all of these modes are acting. And this condition just means you only retain the degrees of freedom that are cyclically symmetric. <clears throat> and this condition imposes the condition that at each site, you're not keeping all oscillators Y and Z, but you're only keeping those that uh, satisfy the corresponding C equal to zero condition. And that's the way you can get the singleton representation of PSU 2,2 slash 4 from this oscillator construction. And again, that's something that's prominently featured in the spin chain description of this setup. So all be told, what you get, you're going to get W many copies because you have W many sites. This runs from one to W. At each site, you have a singleton representation because of this condition. And then you only retain those states that are cyclically invariant. And it's known that that reproduces exactly the spectrum of free super mills. So the picture is that the W spectrally float sector 
describes exactly the degrees of freedom that involve W many fields in n equals to four super mills, where each of the fields is any of the elements of the singleton representation, which is another way of saying any of the fundamental fields and their derivatives. So, so that's how this world sheet theory, modulo all the assumptions about what the physical states are, reproduces exactly the spectrum of free n equals to four super mills. And given the fact that it sort of ties together with various of these ideas that have been flowing around, and the fact that it seems to be the natural generalization from ADS3 cos S3 makes us somewhat confident that this is the right world sheet theory to describe free n equals to four super mills in four dimensions. And thereby, starting from there, one has maybe a chance to prove the ads CFT correspondence. But obviously, as is clear from what I'm saying, there are many steps that still need to be done. So I'm, I'm, I'm skipping a little bit uh, over some stuff here. So let me conclude by saying that I hope I've convinced you that uh, we have very good evidence that the symmetric orbit field theory itself is exactly due to the string theory with one unit of nervous words and Schwartz flux on ADS3 cos S3 cross T4. I think the spectrum really agrees precisely and the correlators, at least we produce the structure of the symmetric orbit for correlators from the world sheet. I think that is already very striking and resolves many of these confusions people had about how this structure could emerge. This, uh, the world sheet plays the role of the covering surface and thereby this doesn't just work to leading order in one over N, but in some sense, it automatically works to all orders in one over n because the higher genus contributions from the world sheet will reproduce the one over n corrections uh, from the symmetric orbital perspective. So this is uh, this is not just planar ADS CFT correspondence, but it's perturbative in one over n to all orders in perturbation theory, and you really see it geometrically. In some sense, it makes it manifest how it works, and uh, and Lawrence Eberhardt. Worked up. So I explained to you this localization argument on the <clears throat> on the sphere. So so Lawrence uh, uh, generalized this for the case of the SL2R word identities to higher genus, and then my student Bob Knighton, who will be giving the the the, the, the exercise class on Sunday, uh, did it in the hybrid description that I've described. So there is so we've checked that this also works at higher genus. So this really seems to realize this idea on the nose, and therefore really produces also all perturbative corrections in one over n. Um, this is a very special theory. It has it sort of seems to be topological in some sense, although we don't quite know exactly what's the right language. So for example, only short representations of PSU 1 comma 1 slash 2 appear. So it feels like only being some topological sector. And then these correlation functions are localized to these isolated points in moduli space, which means that the modular integral really becomes the sum. So this is a very, very uh, suggestive of some sort of topological underlying theory, but exactly how this fits in, we haven't understood. Um, uh, what's key is that both sides are explicitly solvable, have free field realizations, and therefore you can really check this to your heart's delight. And since uh, we've written these papers, there have, we have performed some more checks and there are many more you can do. And this is really a laboratory where you can separately understand everything on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side and see exactly how they fit together. And then finally, I touched upon the idea that this generalizes to ADS5 cross S5, namely that you replace uh, these uh, four symplectic bosons and fermions by eight symplectic bosons and fermions. And at least the spectrum seems to come out right, at least if you follow our proposal for what the physical state condition should be. And we believe that opens the door for trying to prove the ADS CFT correspondence. Given the fact that this ADS5 S5 world sheet theory is so similar to ADS3 plus S3, many of the features will go through. So for example, we expect there'll be a similar localization property. That's something we are currently trying to understand. And that would also allow you then to calculate correlators in the ADS5 plus S5 setting. And that should allow us eventually to check that we reproduce the correct anomalous uh, conformal dimensions and so on. So I think there's, there are many things to be done, but I think this is a promising route towards uh, really establishing ADS CFT at one point in moduli space in the four dimensional setting. And I think this is an, an interesting development that deserves to be further studied. So I'll thank you for your attention and um, obviously open for questions.
<clears throat> Thank you very much, Matthias, for a set of three very, very uh, nice lectures, which will no doubt be very useful for students wanting to work in this area. Uh, so, questions? <clears throat> Maybe I can ask, uh, ask something. So, uh, in, in the ADS5 case, do you, is it too early to ask uh, questions like what uh, uh, non perturbative corrections to correlation functions, how to go about calculating those? For instance, uh, the instant on corrections allowed those. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's too early. I mean, that's even too early in ADS three. I mean, I think uh, we are we are. I mean, I think so. ADS five. I think what we are trying to understand now is this localization property to see the structure of the correlators, and our hope is that we can see the perturbative corrections. That would be our first hope. What we want mm -hmm. to see is that this world sheet theory not just reproduces the spectrum, but also produces the anomalous dimensions of the. Right. Kanishi operator, what have you, in yes. in n equals to four, and I think that's the first target, and that's already hard enough. So mm -hmm. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what we are currently struggling with. I mean, it's not conceptually struggling; it's technically struggling. There again wants to be some covering map, but now the covering map goes must go into twister space. So we're not exactly sure what's the correct condition on holomorphic maps from the world sheet into twister space and so on. So, okay. but you can follow your nose. But uh, absolutely, I mean, once once I think we've sort of convinced ourselves this works, then one can address problems of uh, like, what are the instantons? How can I see non-perturbative corrections on the world sheet and so on? Right. We've, we've touched a little bit on it in the context of ADS3. We've tried to be constructing the, the deep brains of the world sheet theory, but we haven't also there exactly understood what their role is in the symmetric orbit field yet. So I think we are in the early stage. Okay. <clears throat> uh, any other questions? If you just raise your hand, uh, I'll unmute you. Yes, so Pranobesh, oh, Pranobesh, why don't I unmute you? Will you be able to ask your question verbally? Yeah, Pranobesh, go ahead. Yeah, so I am asking for a generic uh, group, non compact group at level one. So how general is the street treatment of spectral flow and corresponding covering map localization? Oh, that, that I haven't thought about. Um, I mean, my impression is that, uh, that, that this localization hinges on, 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 the, on, on the symplectic bosons. And I'm not sure whether for every level one non-compact group, you will have symplectic bosons in their free field realization. So I would expect that you will get something like this localization whenever your free field uh, realized. So, I mean, I assume you are, you are sort of implicitly assuming that a level one theory has a, has a free field realization, like most level one affine algebras do. And, uh, and so my guess would be you would get a localization provided that involves symplectic bosons. Okay. okay. Yeah, there is a question in the chat box. Uh, Umkar is asking the k equal to one condition was used in matching the no. spectra on the ADS and CFT sites, but was it also necessary to localize the vertex operator correlator? And that's a very good question. So, in some sense, you see, so in the description I gave you, k equals one is baked into the k right from the start because we use the free field realization, and the free field realization only works at level one, right? So if you go back to, to, uh, to what we do here, so, I mean, it came from, from looking at these correlators. And, and this is only possible at level one, right? I mean, for higher level, P as you 2, 1, 1 slash 2, you don't have symplectic bosons. You don't have a free field realization. So that's how it's visible in the, in the hybrid description. But I was mentioning that we also derived this first in the SL2R description. Now in the SL2R description, our methods weren't quite as powerful to prove that it's really delta function localized, but we derived constraints on the correlators. And this constraint became very stringent and basically gave you the covering map solution provided that the level was equal to one and the spin was equal to a half. So there, this constraint on the level and the spin emerged in some, as a way of, the situation where you have a very special, where the covering map solution appears as the solution to your water identities on the world sheet. 
Now, subsequently, uh, Lawrence and, and Andrea Day have also studied the SL2R uh, Westphalmino-Witten correlators uh, at different values of K. And there, for, if K is bigger than one, you, get to, you don't get localization. You get solutions that are not localized and the localized solution are some sort of singular limit that appears when you take K equals to one. So I think K equals to one is totally critical for localization. Localization will not happen uh, in, in any shape or form, uh, at least not in the way we see it if K is bigger than one. So this is very specific to, to the level one theory. Okay, uh, so Loga is asking, do you have an idea ah. as to how to write down tensionless duals for EVGM? That ah, that's very good. No, yeah. no, 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 we haven't. Somehow, I don't know, but I have this feeling that uh, the odd dimensional, the even dimensional ADS spaces are very different. And then somehow this is, uh, all of this seems to work. I mean, it comes from ADS3 and it has a very natural generalization to ADS5, but I have no idea how to generalize it to ADS4. Um, is there some indication from, let's say, you know, like the integrable story, uh, like people have done some spin chain kind of things for ABJM also, right? Um, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's a very good question. I, I haven't thought about it. You're right. I mean, given the fact that our symplectic bosons were really the affine version of the spin chain description for n equals to four super middle, one could also try to start from that corner. One could say, Let's look at the spin chain for for AVJM and then uh, and then, and then see whether we can guess what sort of world sheet fields that wants to give rise to. Now it's a good question. I haven't tried it. Yeah, uh, I had one more question, which is like, is it obvious how to think about let's say D brains in this uh, uh, kind of uh, you know twister kind of description? Um, well, so let's so. Say, uh, I mean, on a certain level, it is, right? I mean, so, I mean, for, for somebody like me, D brains is boundary conformal field theory. So it's basically you take your world sheet theory and you're not analyzing it on the closed Riemann surface, but you're analyzing it on a Riemann surface with the boundary. Then you're asking what are the boundary conditions I have to impose at, uh, say, the upper half plane or the disk so that I don't destroy my symmetries. And basically, you can, there's a very natural guess for what sort of boundary conditions you should write down for the symplectic bosons and the fermions. And, uh, and together with, uh, with Bob Knighton and uh, Jakob Bosmera, we studied this for the, um, for the PSU 1,1 slash 2 case. So there is a natural class of D brains you can write down for this boundary for the, for the, for the world sheet theory. And they seem to behave naturally and they seem to correspond to somehow defects or, or, or brains in the in the in the in the symmetric orbital theory, but exactly how this fits together with the idea that they should describe the non-perturbative corrections of the symmetric orbital, I haven't quite understood. But there's a recent paper of uh, of Bob Jacob and me from last a few months ago, where we where we construct these uh, boundary conditions for ADS three, and one should be able to do something similar for ADS five. Thanks. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yeah, Reiko has a question in the chat box. Can there uh, be a DS version of this tensionless duality? Uh, that I don't know. That I don't know. Somehow, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I've, yeah, the CETA CFT has always confused me, and I'm probably not the only person whom this has confused. Um, I think I, I know there is this. I think the uh, the most convincing version of it is this higher spin version due to to Hartman and Strominger and Anindos. And somehow, since this is related to this sort of higher spin, I mean, it comes sort of from this higher spin corner. Maybe there is a way of trying to to generalize this. And in, in that context, I've forgotten. But they had to somehow. I mean, normally what these people do is they sort of analytically continue, and one could try to do something similar here. But I'm not sure whether that would lead to success or not. But it may actually be interesting to to have a look at that. Yeah. Okay, so I don't see any further questions. Uh, 
a real chance. Uh, so let's uh, thank Matthias for the set of three excellent lectures. And uh, all the uh, lecture notes and the videos will be available online for uh, for future use. So thank you, Matthias, very much. And thank you. Uh, all the best. Take care, and hopefully we meet uh, in better times. Yeah, it would be great to come to India again. Yeah. Absolutely, yes, indeed. Okay. okay. Take care. Thanks. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. So we meet again at seven thirty to continue Sujit's lectures. Bye.